Hi, y'all. Uh, join me today as I start another book. I know it's been a while. Uh, hopefully, it won't take me as long to do this one as it did the other one. I, I'll be able to get to it quicker instead of having to spread it out so much. But it is another book by Eudora Welty. And I told you before, she is one of my favorite authors. Uh, she was from the South, uh, from Mississippi. And she wrote books dealing with the South. And she wrote in like the early 1900s, maybe some of the mid-1900s. Uh, 1973, she won a prize. I cannot remember now what the prize was, um, but it was for her book, The Optimist's Daughter. But today we're going to start reading one called Delta Wedding. So we will pick up with chapter one here, which is where we will start. The nickname of the train was the Yellow Dog. Its real name was the Yazoo Delta. It was a mixed train. The day was the 10th of September, 1923, afternoon. Laura McRaven, who was nine years old, was on her first journey alone. She was going up from Jackson to visit her mother's people, the Fairchilds, at their plantation named Shell Mound at Fairchilds, Mississippi. When she got there, Poor Laura, little motherless girl, they would all run out and say, for her mother had died in the winter, and they had not seen Laura since the funeral. Her father had come as far as Yazoo City with her and put her on the dog. Her cousin Dabney Fairchild, who was 17, was going to be married, but Laura could not be in the wedding for the reason that her mother was dead. Of these facts, the one most pertinent in Laura's mind in Laura's mind was the most intimate one, that her age was nine. In the passenger car, every window was propped open with a stick of kindling wood. A breeze blew through hot and then cool, fragrant of the woods and yellow flowers and of the train. The yellow butterflies flew in at any window, out at any other, and outdoors one of them could keep up with the train, which then seemed to be racing with the butterfly. Overhead, a black lamp in which a circle of flowers had been cut out swung round and round on a chain as the car rocked from side to side, <clears throat> sending down dainty drifts of kerosene smell. The dog was almost sure to reach Fairchild's before the lamp would be lighted by Mr. Terry Black, the, conduct the conductor who had promised her father to watch out for her. Laura had the seat facing the stove, but of course no fire was burning it in now. She sat leaning at the window, the light in the sooty air trying to make her close her eyes. Her ticket to Fairchild's was stuck up in her match oven straw hat, in imitation of the drummer across the aisle. Once the dog stopped in the open fields and Laura saw the engineer, Mr. Doolittle, go out and pick some specific especially fine goldenrod there, for whom she could not know. Then the long September cry rang from the thousand unseen locusts, urgent at the open window, so the train. Then at one place, a white foxy farm dog ran beside the yellow dog for a distance just under Laura's window, barking sharply, and then they left him behind, or he turned back. And then, as if a hand reached along the green ridge and all of a sudden pulled down with a sweep, like a scoop in the bend, the hill and every tree in the world and left cotton fields, the delta began. The drummer with a groan sank into sleep. Mr. Terry Black walked by and took the, took the tickets out of their hats. Laura brought up her saved banana, peeled it down and bit into it. Thoughts went out of her head, and the landscape filled it. In the delta, most of the world seemed sky. The clouds were large, larger than horses or houses, larger than boats or churches or gins, larger than anything except the fields of the Fairchilds planted. Her nose in the banana skin as in the cup of a lily, she watched the delta. The land was perfectly flat and level, but it shimmered like the wing of a lighted dragonfly. It seemed strum as though it were an instrument and something had touched it. Sometimes in the cotton were trees with one, 
two or three arms. She could draw better trees than those were. Sometimes like a fuzzy caterpillar, looking in the cotton was a winding line of thick green willows and cypresses. And when the tree and when the train crossed this green running on a lark on a loud iron bridge, down its center like a golden mark on the caterpillar's back would be a bayou. When the day lengthened, a rosy light lay over the cotton. Laura stretched her arm out the window and let the soot sprinkle it. There went a black mule in the diamond light of a far distance. Going into the light, a child drove a black mule home, and all behind the hidden track through the fields was marked by the lifting faded train of dust. The delta buzzers that seemed to wheel as wide and high as the sun with evening were going down to settling into faraway violet tree stumps for the night. In the delta, the sunsets were red as light. The sun went down lopsided and wide as a rose on a stem in the west, and the west was a milk-white edge like the foam of the sea. The sky, the field, <clears throat> and the little track in the bayou over and over, all that had been bright or dark was now one color. From the war warm window sill, the endless fields glowed like a hearth in firelight, and Laura, looking out, leaning on her elbows with her head between her hands, felt what an arriver in a land feels, that slow, hard pounding in the breast. Fair childs, fair childs, Mr. Terry Black lifted down the suitcase Laura's father had put up in the rack. The dog ran through an iron bridge over James Bayou and passed a long, twilighted gin, its tin side looking first, like a blue lake and a platform where cotton bales were so close they seemed to lean out to the train. Behind it, dark gold and shadowy was the river, the Yasu. They came to the station, the dark yellow color of goldenrod, and stopped. Through the windows, Laura could see five or six cousins at once all jumping up and down at different moments. Each mane of light hair waved like a holiday banner so that you could see the Fairchilds everywhere, even with everybody meeting the train and asking Mr. Terry how he had been since the day before. When Mr. Terry set her on the little iron steps holding her square doll suitcase in which her doll Marmion was horizontally suspended, and gave her a spank, she staggered and was lifted down among flying arms to the earth. Kiss blew it, the baby was put in her face. She was kissed and laughed at, and her hat would have been snatched away but for the new elastic that pulled it back, and then she was half carried along like a drunken reveler at a festival, not quite recognizing who anyone was. India hadn't come. We couldn't find her, and Dabney hadn't come. She was going to be married. They piled her into the Studebaker, into the little folding seat, with Ranny reaching sections of an orange into her mouth from where he stood behind her. Where were her suitcases? They drove rattling across the Yazoo Bridge and whirled through the shady river-smelling street where the town, Fairchild store, and all looked like a row of dark barns while the boy sang, Abdul the Bull Bull Amir, or shouted, Let Blue It Drive. And the baby was handed over Laura's head and stood between Oren's knees proudly. Oren was 14, a wonderful driver. They went up and down the street three times back into the cotton fields to turn around. Before they went across the bridge again, homeward. Thanks to Marmion, said Oren to Laura kindly. He waved at an old track that did not cross the river, but followed it. Two purple ruts in the strip of wood shadow. Marmion's my dolly, she said. It's not, it's where I was born, said Orin. There was no use in Laura and Orin talking any more about what anything was. On this side of the river were the gin and compress, the railroad track, the Forestville Cemetery, where a mother was buried in the Fairchild lot, the old Methodist church with the steamboat bell glinting pink in the light in Brunswick town where the Negroes were smoking now on every doorstep. 
Then the car traveled in its cloud of dust like a blind being through the fields one after the other, like all one field, but Laura knew they had names. The mound field and moon field after moon lake. When they were as far as the overseer's house, Laura saw all the cousins lean out and spit, and she did too. I thought you all liked Mr. Bascom, she said after they got by. It's not Mr. Bascom now, crazy, they said. Is it, Blewett? Not Mr. Bascom now. Then the car crossed the little bayou bridge, whose rackety rhythm she remembered, and there was Shell Mound. Facing James Bayou, back under the planted pecan grove, it was gently glowing in the late summer light, the brightest thing in the evening. The tall, white, wide frame house with a porch all around, its bay tower on one side, its tinted windows open and its curtains stirring, and even from here plainly to be heard a song coming out of the music room played on the piano by a stranger to Laura. They curved in at the gate all the way up the drive. The boy cousins with a shout would jump and spill out and pick up a ball from the ground and throw it rocket-like. But the carriage block in front of the house, Laura was pulled out of the car and held by the hand. Shelley had hold of her, the oldest girl. Laura did not know if she had been in the car with her or not. Shelley had her hair still done up long, parted in the middle, and a ribbon around it low across her brow and knitted behind like a chariot racer. She wore a fountain pen on a chain now and had her initials done in runny ink on her tennis shoes over the ankle bones. Inside the house, the piece all at once ended. Shelley, somebody called imploringly. Dabney is an example of madness on earth, said Shelley now. And then she ran off trail by Blewett, beating plaintively on a drum found in the grass with a little stick. The boys were scattered like magic. Laura was deserted. Grass softly touched her legs and her garter roses growing sweet and springy, for this was the country. On the narrow little walk along the front of the house, hung over with closing lemon lilies, there was a quieting and vanishing of sound. It was not yet dark. The sky was the color of violets, and the snow-white moon in the sky had not yet begun to shine. Where it hung above the water tank back of the house, the swallows were circling busy as the spinning of a top. By the flaky front steps, a thrush was singing water-like notes from the sweet olive tree which was in flower. It was not too dark to see the breast of the thrush or the little white blooms either. Laura remembered everything with the fragrance and the song. She looked up the steps through the porch where there was a wooden scroll on the screen door that her finger knew how to trace and lifted her eyes to an old fan light now reflecting a sky light as of a past summer that she had been dared, oh, by Maureen, to throw a stone through and had not. <clears throat> she dropped her suitcase in the grass and ran to the backyard and jumped up with two of the boys on the joggling board. In between Roy and Little Battle, she jumped and the delights of anticipation seemed to shake her up and down. She remembered, as one remembers first the eyes of a loved person, the old blue water cooler on the back porch, how thirsty she always was here, among the round and square wooden tables always piled with snap beans, turnip greens, and onions from the day stripped to greenwood. And while you drank your eyes were on the gre this green place, here in the backyard, the joggling board, the neglected greenhouse, Aunt Ellen's guineas in the old buggy, the stable wall elbow deep in a vine. And in the parlor, she knew was a clover-shaped footstool covered with rose violet where she would sit and sliding doors to the music room that she could open and shut. In the halls would be the rising smell of girls fudge cooking, the sound of the phone by the roll top desk going unanswered. She could remember mostly the dining room, the paintings by great Aunt Mashula that was dead, a full blown yellow roses and a watermelon split to the heart of a jackknife and every ornamental plate around the rail different because painted by a different ant. 
at a different time. The big table never quite cleared the innumerable packs of old, old playing cards. She could remember India's paper dolls coming out flatter than the law books than hers from a shoebox and smelling as if they were scorched from it. She remembered the servants, Bitsy, Roxy, Little Uncle, and Violet. She put out her arms like wings and knew in her fingers the thready pattern of red roses in the carpet on the stairs, and she could hear the high-pitched calls and answers going up the stairs and down. She thought of the upstairs hall where it was twilight all the time from the green shadow of an awning and where an old lopsided baseball lay all summer in a silver dish on the lid of the paper crown plantation desk, and how away at either end of the hall was the balcony and the little square butterflies that flew so high were going by and the June bugs knocking. She remembered the sleeping porches full of late sleepers, some strangers to her, always among them when India led her through and showed them to her. She remembered well the cotton lint on ceilings and lampshades fresh every morning like a present from the fairies that made Violet moan. Little Battle crowded her a little as he jumped and she had to move down the board a few inches. They could play an endless game of hide and seek in so many rooms and up and down the hall that intersected and turned into dead end porches and rooms full of wax begonias and elephant ears or rooms full of trunks. She remembered the nights, the moon vine, the ever blooming cape jessamines, the verbena smelling under running feet, the lateness of dancers. A dizziness, a dizziness rose in Laura's head and Roy crowded her now, but she jumped on keeping in with their rhythm. She remembered life in the undeterminate number of other rooms going on around her in India. <clears throat> where they lay in bed, life not stopping for a moment, in deference to children going to sleep, but filling with later and later laughter, with Uncle Battle reciting, break, 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 the phone ringing its two longs and a short for the Fairchilds, Aunt Mac reading the Bible aloud, was she dead yet? The Viston planters arguing with Uncle Battle and her other uncle, Uncle George, from dining room to library to porch. Aunt Ellen slipping by in the hall looking for something or someone. The distant silvery creak of the porch swing by night like a frog's voice. There would be little Ranny crying out in his dream in the winding of the Victrola, and then a song called I Wish I Could Shimmy Like My Sister Kate or Uncle Pink's favorite. Where was he? Sir Harry Lauder singing Stop Your Tickling Jock. The girls that were old enough dressed in colors called Jade and Flamingo danced with each other around the dining room table until the boys came to get them and could be watched from the upper landing cavorting below like marvelous mermaids down a transparent sea. In bed, Laura and India would slap mosquitoes and tell each other things. Last summer, India had told Laura the showboat that came on the high water in the same old rabbit's foot minstrel as always, and Laura told India babes in the wood, Thurston the magician, Annette Kellerman, and daughter of the gods, and Clara Kimball Young in drums of jeopardy. And if Laura went off to sleep, India would choke her. She remembered the baying of the dogs at night and how Roy believed when you heard dogs go bay, a convict had go, got out of parchment and they were after him in the swamp. Every night of the world, the dogs would bay and Roy would lie somewhere in the house shaking in his bed. Just then, with the last move down the joggling board, Roy edged Laura off. She ran back to the steps and picked up her suitcase again. Then her heart pounded. India came abruptly around the house, bathed and dressed, busily watering the verbena and the flower bed out of a doll's cream pitcher, one drop to each plant. India, too, was nine. Her hair was all spun out down her back, and she had a blue ribbon in it. Laura touched her own buster, buster brown hair, tangled now beyond anyone's help. Their white dresses, Laura's in the suitcase, folded by her father, and for a man to fold anything suddenly nearly killed her. 
were still identical. India had blue insertion run in the waist now and Laura had white, but the same little interlocking three hoops were prior stitched in the yokes and their identical gold lockets still banged there against their chest. My mother is dead, said Laura. India looked around at her and said, Greeny, Laura took a step back. We never did unjoin, said India. Greeny. All right, Laura said, owe oh, you something. She stopped and put a pinch of grass in her shoe. You have to wash now, said India. She added, looking in her pitcher. Here's a drop of water. I think she's going to get clean with just one drop of water. I don't. All of a sudden, Maureen ran out from under the con trees. The cousin, who was funny in her head, thought it was not her fault. Besides her own fine clothes, she got India's dresses that she wanted and India's ribbons. And India said she would get them till she died. She never talked plain. Every word was two words to her and had an L in it. Now she ran in front of Laura and straddled the walk at the foot of the steps. She danced from side to side with her arms spread, chanting, Cullin Lala, can it get la by? She was nine, too. Roy and Little Battle ran up blandly as if they had never let Laura joggle with them at all, giving no recognition. Orin walked tall as a man up from the bayou with a live fish he must have just caught, jumping on a string. He waved it at little Ranny, who at that moment rode out the front door and down the steps standing on the back of, the tri of his tricycle, like Ben Hur, a towel tied around his neck and flying behind him. The dinner bell was ringing inside over and over the way Roxy rang, like an insistence against belief. Laura avoiding side of the fish, avoiding India's little drop, and Ranny and Maureen made her way up the steps. Just as she reached the top, she threw up. There she waited like a little dog. But Aunt Eileen, though she was late for everything, was now running out the screen door with open arms. She was the mother of them all. Something fell behind her, her apron as she came, and she was as breathless as any of her children. Now she knelt and held Laura very firmly. Laura, poor little motherless girl, she said. When Laura lifted her head, she kissed her. She sent India for a ring and wet cloth. Laura put her head on Aunt Ellen's shoulder and sank her teeth in the thick Irish lace on the collar of her white voile dress, which smelled like sweet peas. She hugged her and touched her forehead. The steady head held so near to hers with its flying soft hair and its erect bearing of gentle, explicit, but unfathomed alarm. With the cool on her face, she could see clearer and clearer, though it was almost dark now, the pearl-edged side comb so hazardously bringing up the strands of Aunt Ellen's dark hair. <clears throat> she let her go, and if she could, she would have smoothed and patted her aunt's hair and cleared the part with her own fingers and said, Aunt Ellen, you must never mind, but of course she couldn't. Then she jumped up and ran after Orin into the house, beating India to the table. Okay, we're going to stop there for today. All right, so what do you think so far? Um, I know some of you may be wondering, a boy driving at 14? Well, uh, of course, back at that time, you know, they may have been allowed to drive. I don't know, but I do know when I lived in Mississippi, you could get your learner's permit at age 14, your driver's license at 15. Um, there was something else I was wondering. Oh, and we talked about their ring on the phone. Well, they, back then, and actually uh, where I live up until the, I guess, early 90s, they still had what were called party lines. And uh, you could pick your phone up near people. You're all connected to one line. And you could pick it up and listen on all the other people's conversation that were connected to your line. But everybody had their own ring so you know which which ring was yours and when you should answer and when you shouldn't. Uh, but a lot of people would like to listen in on other people's
conversations. Okay, well, that's it for today. I hope you'll join me when I read again. Y'all have a good day.